concludes all questions uh, to the Minister. We now move to topical questions. Question number two has been withdrawn. Raymond McCartney. Mr McCartney. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister if he's had any discussions with the Ulster Bank in, in light of the, the recent sort of uh, glitches in their, their IT machines and what was the outcome of those discussions and did, did he receive any reassurances? Yeah, I, I thank the member for, for a question, a very, very topical question, probably the first topical question I've had. Um, and topical questions, even though this is my fourth go at it. Um, yes, I have had, I've had discussions as soon as I became aware that there were problems developing last night and the customers were expressing concern that they couldn't make payments and that they couldn't access their own money out of cash machines and the embarrassment that it was causing some of them in stores when they couldn't pay or whenever they needed perhaps emergency access to their own cash from a hole in the wall, they couldn't get it. Um, I made contact and made communication, had communication overnight and early this morning with Ulster Bank. I have this afternoon uh, spoken on the telephone to Stephen Cruz, who is the head of retail banking in, in the Ulster Bank. And I think you know, they, they accept and they understand that this is being bad news for, for their customers. It is the third time uh, that such an incident has happened, albeit not as bad as the one back in June, I think it was, of 2012. I think we can see some solace and some reassurance in the fact that they have, it is not, I am told, it is not the same IT issue. I'm not, not sure whether that is something to seek solace from, but it is not the same problem, so therefore one wouldn't expect the reoccurrence and, and the longevity of the last problem. I am informed that all problems have now been overcome and that, um, you know, that the, um, yes, and the problem as arose last evening now just seems to be fixed, although there are some indications in RBS across the water that some problems do still exist. Uh, other banks have had similar issues, I know, but this is, of course, the third time at Ulster Bank have promised it, and I don't think they need me to tell them that it does cause some debt damage to their reputation um, and it causes some concern for their customers. I, I have sought some assurances insofar as I can that this sort of uh, incident doesn't happen again, but you know, you're dealing with IT systems and who knows what, what sometimes can happen to it. Again, I seek some solace in the fact that they um, have assured me that RBS continue to invest quite he heavily in its IT systems because they appreciate and realise that this is causing them some, some difficulties as, an, as a bank. Mr. Kids Vegas lesson era. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his comprehensive answer? You know, given that, I mean, and the Minister himself has said this that, the, that this is perhaps happening all too frequently. You know, could part of the discussions, and would the Minister agree that part of the discussion has to be a decoupling of the Ulster Bank IT systems from the Royal Bank of Scotland to protect ourselves here? The look, I, I mean, that, that's that's an operational matter that would be have to be considered by, by Ulster Bank in the context of its, its ownership by RBS Group. I would imagine that decoupling it would come at a considerable cost to Ulster Bank, and I would be worried that even though in some ways it might seem like the right thing to do, it might come as a, you know, with a great price tag, a huge price tag to, to customers here in Northern Ireland who would ultimately have to, to pay for, for, for something like that. But look, I, I, you know, I think I, I will continue to press on the basis that I have no authority or say over what the banks do at all, but continue to press them. Look, they're, the Ulster Bank, and we've, we've recognised this previously in this House, are of critical importance to the banking system in Northern Ireland and ergo critical importance to the economy in Northern Ireland. And it is important that their customers can access the fund, their funds when they need to access their funds. Uh, I am assured as well by the bank that anybody who has been out of pocket as a result of this latest problem will be reimbursed. Anybody who continues to experience problems of any kind should either call into their local branch or contact on the telephone. Ulster Bank's call centre. And I am worried about one other aspect, which I think is worth reiterating in this House, uh, in case anybody is listening, is that some criminals would appear to be trying to capitalise on this and are issuing phishing emails to Ulster Bank customers saying that because of the system crash that they should re-enter their account details and all of that. So it would be a terrible shame if people, having lost out, you know, having had the embarrassment, maybe have not been able to make a payment, then fall foul of some criminal activity as well. So I would just use this opportunity to try to reiterate the general public not to fall for that. The bank themselves will not be asking anybody for their, their PIN number or their bank account details or anything like that online. Alec Eaton. Can I ask uh, the Minister what measures he can take to prevent the Executive's 2003 and 14 allocation of financial transaction capital being surrendered back to Her Majesty's Government? I thank, thank the Member for, for the question. Over, over recent months I have 
uh, along with my Scottish and Welsh counterparts, uh, lobbied the Chief Secretary to the Treasury for end year flexibility in respect of financial transactions capital, which is the, the member of the House will know is um, a new device which the, the government are bringing forward to try to increase spending on capital projects in the private sector. Uh, I'm pleased, though, to confirm that such a scheme has now been agreed amongst Treasury and the devolved administrations. This scheme will allow the Northern Ireland Executive flexibility to carry forward unspent financial transactions capital funding across each of the next two financial years. This flexibility amounts to 20% carry forward of unused financial transactions capital funding into 2014-15 and 10% into 15-16. This will ensure that we have more time to develop suitable schemes and will significantly reduce the risk of any funding being surrendered to Her Majesty's Treasury. Um, could I ask uh, the Minister what is the position for Scotland and Wales? Scotland and Wales will also receive, receive the same flexibilities that, that we in Northern Ireland receive. So they will receive 20% um, carryover in the first year and 10% carryover in the second year. I'm not sure what that is as it represents in terms of their total of expenditure, but in terms of Northern Ireland, it can, can inform the House that um, we have, we have, um, this year we will be able to carry forward into next year some £9.4 million, pounds, and next year we'll be able to carry forward into 15, 16, £5.4 million. Pounds. I've been encouraged by the engagement that I've had with uh, other departments and that my officials have had with other departments, and, and departments are now starting coming forward with some exceptionally good schemes that would use up financial transactions capital. So I would be optimistic that we won't have to use all of that carry forward, but it is a useful device to have nonetheless in case we do hit a situation where because they're very demand-led, these schemes, one of them maybe can't move forward, and we're, we need to have that flexibility, or else we would, would possibly lo lose it back to Treasury, and that's not something that, that I or anybody in this House wants to see happen. Question number four, Mr Kelly's not misplaced. Katrina Rahn. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd also like to thank ministers for, uh, for his answers to date. The question I have is about the Narrow Water Bridge, um, and I wonder would the minister agree with me that uh, the construction of this bridge will create badly needed jobs in terms of tourism and construction? I wonder would he agree with me in relation to that? I, I, I'm disappointed. I'm as Perhaps not as disappointed as a member, given that she represents a constituency, but I'm disappointed that this scheme hasn't been able to go forward, Mr. Speaker. Um, and, and certainly listening to representatives from the area who are in this House, and indeed listening to, to others from that area, there was a great belief that the construction of this bridge um, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't only just you know, improve connectivity, which was important, but would provide a boost to, to tourism on both sides of the border. So in that respect, it is disappointing that the scheme isn't going, going ahead. Um, I am now in the position alongside my counterpart in the Irish Republic with having roughly £17 million pounds worth of EU funding unspent. Uh, it is important now that we get that money spent, and that now is my priority. As disappointing as it will be for the member and people in that area that, that scheme isn't, the Narrow Water Bridge scheme isn't going forward, um, Northern Ireland and indeed the Republic of Ireland and I make sure that we get the money that we have from Europe spent on a project. Can I urge the Minister? Um, the best way of spending the money is by liaising with his southern counterparts to ensure that the project does go ahead. And I'm surprised to hear uh, that he doesn't believe that it will go ahead, because with the right political will, uh, there is, it can go ahead. And can the minister uh, let me know what he has done and his department to ensure that the project does go ahead rather than lose money um, to this important project? The unfortunate reality for, for, the, for the member, indeed for the, the project, is that the letter of offer issued by the SEUPB has now been withdrawn. So that the scheme has, is off the table in that regard, and our priority now is to ensure that the EU funding that is available to us is spent. Uh, I was in Brussels early last week, uh, spoke to officials from the senior officials from the DG Regio who deal with um, um, indirect funding and peace funding, and it was very, very, the message that came very, very clearly from them was that the impression that it would give if Northern Ireland was unable to spend this money um, whenever we have sought and received a, an extension of peace funding into a, a fourth strand wouldn't be a good impression if we weren't able to spend it. So my priority now is, whilst it may be disappointing for, for members that the Narrow Water Bridge Scheme isn't going forward, my priority and the priority of my counterparts in the Irish Republic was to ensure that the money that is available to us is spent on a project which is equally worthwhile and, and improves infrastructure um, on a cross-border basis. Phil Flanagan. 
Um, the Minister will be aware of HMRC's plans to, to close service here and, and reduce um, a significant quantity of jobs. Can the Minister give us an update with any discussions he has had with HMRC about trying to retain those jobs locally? I am very concerned. I, I think some of the, the jobs are located in Enniskillen in the members' constituency, so we will have a particular concern about it. None are located in my constituency, but I am pretty sure that some of the people working in Belfast and Dorchester House will be employed, or will be from, from all parts of, of the province. So it is deeply concerning that uh, HMRC are coming forward with these plans to uh, make quite a, quite a few hundred people potentially uh, redundant in Northern Ireland. Um, my officials are discussing they say, have, have discussed and will continue to discuss this issue with their counterparts in HMRC. I am due to meet Treasury Ministers actually tomorrow, and it is something that I may be able to raise with them in the margins of that meeting, which is actually about banking, first and foremost. Phil Flanagan. I thank the Minister for his response. It will be interesting to be a fly on the wall at this meeting when he discusses banking and HMRC. Um, can, can the Minister give us an assurance that, that he and the, his executive colleagues will do everything in their power um, to try and retain these jobs locally and, and, and particularly engage in discussions with HMRC to see if any of those services that are, are being transferred um, into Britain could actually be delivered better using the existing first class services that are on offer here? Yeah, look, absolutely. The member can have an absolute assurance that myself and colleagues will do, make uh, every effort that we possibly can to retain all of those jobs in the way that we have fought hard to ensure that the DVA jobs are retained in, in Coleraine. I know that my executive colleague, the Minister for Enterprise, Arnie Foster, is, is particularly taking forward this issue, not least because she has the same constituency interest that the, the member has. Uh, and I think we can, as we did uh, DVA, and I think we can do in HMRC as well, make a robust case. Uh, to HMRC that actually retaining, whilst the, the nature of the job that the people who are employed in HMRC in Northern Ireland do may change as a result of changes that HMRC are going through, that they do represent a good value for money solution to some of the problems that they have and some of the, the cost-cutting measures that they will have to introduce. We have done that with uh, child maintenance, we have done that with social security, where we have bid for and won and secured um, repetitively big contracts to provide services back into England. I think we can do likewise for DVA, and I think we can do likewise as well, Mr Speaker, for HMRC too. Jim Allister. Mr Allister. Uh, Minister, under EU regulations, there is a requirement for actual additionality in regard to funding under regional and social funding. Is the Minister satisfied that in a devolutionary arrangement, there is indeed transparent additionality of EU funds? Well, it is a good, it's a good question that the member asks, and I, you know, I, I, I think it is something that perhaps we don't measure as clearly as we might want to measure, uh, and it's something that I'm happy to take away and speak to the officials on how precisely we measure and ensure that there is additionality, um, because as the member is right to point out, it is, it is imperative that if we are getting this money that we are getting something additional for it, and that it is adding value to Northern Ireland and rather than just a redistribution of cash that we might have got anyway from, from Treasury. Mr. I, I welcome the fact that the Minister will do that, and I suggest he conducts a very a severe audit on it, because certainly I had correspondence some years ago from his department, long before his time, which left one with a very distinct impression that there was anything but transparency and a severe question mark over where or not there is actual additionality. And I think it is something that a devolved institution could well be missing out on very substantially. I know the member and I would agree, or agree in our disagreements with many things that the European Union does, and you know, we could, I don't have the time to go through all of that. Um, but you know, what I've always been very, very clear on is that we get as much of our own money back into Northern Ireland to spend on projects that are beneficial to Northern Ireland. So in that respect, I agree with the member as well that we need to have genuine additionality for what we are spending. And you know, without having um, particularly consulted at it in my term in office, I'm happy to, to pick up the issue and correspond back to the member on what I find. Order members, that concludes question time for today. Mr. Wells.